define what that means and uh, start to get into wireframe and details in a second. Uh, but welcome. This year has been definitely a year change for me. Uh, I started out at Kent State originally um, in information services, our IT department, and then went over to um, communications and marketing and um, IdeaBase, which is a student agency on campus. So I was just taught. And then six months ago, uh, I started a new career path uh, as a user experience designer at Marcus Thomas, which is an integrated advertising agency in Cleveland. Uh, some of you have been, may have been familiar with them or with them in the past. And uh, when I started there, it was a big change because it's a larger advertising agency, uh, very structured. We have uh, you know departments for research, strategy, design, and I'm on the design side. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is going to be from a design approach uh, as opposed to more of a research-based approach. And when I got there, we do a lot of websites. Uh, in the ad world, you're very website-based, um, and that's anywhere from large-scale websites to more marketing landing pages and small-scale websites. And what I noticed is they were really, really dependent on wireframes. We didn't get enough of the wireframe. Uh, we, we make wireframes for everything, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, why I think that's so important in a larger agency. And so I had gotten out of the wireframe game a lot in my previous roles. We did it informally and when we, you know, when we needed to, but it wasn't a regular part of the process. And so I haven't heard anyone talk about wireframes in a long time at these conferences. So I thought, why don't we look at how wireframes work into the UX workflow today? How has that changed with new changes in technology and process? And let's revisit our assumptions as to whether they're still an important part of the design process when we're talking about UX. Um, I also started to see articles like this over the past year. So this one is called Wireframes Are Dead, uh, why I haven't used a wireframe for wires in over a year. Uh, this is a fairly, let's say, inflammatory, controversial article on Medium, as they tend to be. Uh, but it got a lot of uh, attention, and has 800, 809 claps, uh, so it must be resonating with people. Uh, and in that article, the author says, Wireframes are great for getting clients to sign off on a project. However, they also lock you into a signed off blank version of your project. Uh, so very, didn't hold back his feelings on how he felt. Um, I also started to see ones um, like on the list of heart, which is a web design um, publication, um, talking about priority guides, a content first alternative to wireframes. And in that article, what they talked about is wireframes killing creativity. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. And I think a lot of these perspectives come more from a visual design perspective rather than a uh, UX design perspective. So we can talk about whether these are valid or not. I thought before we get into the details though, let's talk a little bit about um, what a wireframe is and what your opinion of what that means. Um, we all kind of have an archetypal um, picture in our minds of what a wireframe is. So I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, and just raise your hand if you think this is indeed a wireframe, and there's no wrong answer, it's just like a usability test, so it's not a test of you and, uh, or your ability. Uh, so how about this one? How many say? Okay. No wrong answers, just no wrong answers. Point. Everyone has to vote. Okay, how about these guys? Okay, so a lot of you um, would say yes. Uh, what about this one? Plus for you. It, so it's in grayscale, doesn't that mean it's a wireframe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it means this. it's a perfect thing. Yeah. Okay, so a few more review. So definitely when we talk about in terms of fidelity, one of the lower fidelity kinds of wireframes perhaps. Uh, what about this one? This is kind of like content stacking boxes vertically. Okay, fewer review. Not what we tend to think of when we think of wireframes, certainly. Uh, this one is done in HTML. This is in the browser. Okay. Uh, how about this one? Okay. Now uh, this is kind of like a uh, the content, um, like a, a story format of what might be on a website, but it's not formatted in any way or structured. And finally, how about this one? Okay, two people. Yeah. Uh, and then in terms of fidelity, this would certainly be on the higher end of fidelity. And uh, for many of us, we might not consider this as, oh, as wireframe well. And interestingly, these are all examples that came up when I searched on Google and Dribbble for the word wireframe, right? So 
we have, there is a large um, array of different examples in terms of fidelity um, and approach when we're talking about this little this concept. So it really isn't just one thing. And it's up to you and your team to decide uh, what exactly this term means and how you might use these in your design process, if at all. Uh, one other thing, how many of you have a computer near you um, or accessible? I, I wanted to get some feedback as I'm talking. Uh, if you do have a computer or even a phone, um, I'm going to ask you to just do a little collaborative exercise. Now, you can always jump on one on the side here, too. Uh, I want to ask how you use wireframes, if at all, in your daily process. So if you happen to have a phone, uh, a tablet, uh, or a computer with you, uh, I have this Google Doc started. It's at bit.ly slash wireframe 2019. And I'll show you what this looks like. Um, so this is uh, so anyone can jump in and add your responses. And they can be really short responses. Uh, it can just be a few lines. I just want to kind of get the idea of you know, how, how, do you, how do you use them? Do you use them? Um, in terms of fidelity, do you prefer sketches, high, high fidelity mock-ups, interactive? What do you use? And then any advantages or disadvantages that you could think of um, within your organization. Now, if you bring this up on your phone, um, and I'll bring that up again, it's bit.ly uh, .com slash, or bit.ly slash wireframe2019. If you bring it up on your phone, especially iPhone, I believe it's going to prompt you to install the app for Google Docs if you happen to have that. Um, if you're on Chrome browser, it will let you edit it on your phone directly, um, like on Android or iOS. So bit.ly slash wireframe2019. And you can add to this throughout the discussion. Uh, I've seen this done before, but it kind of creates a cool log of what the sentiment is in, in the room on this topic. And we'll go over it um, at the end of the discussion um, so you can keep adding to it. Like I said, just add a few words, give, give me some feedback so we get a feel for um, how the room feels at this moment. Okay, so everyone have that URL? Please, let's wire from 2018. So as you're kind of adding your thoughts there, uh, let's go ahead and just define what I'm talking about. Uh, these are kind of the, uh, the main and primary definitions you might find online when we're talking about wireframes. So what is a wireframe? Certainly it's an asset that's used early in the UX design process, um, and typically it might be created after you've defined your strategy and what the overall user flow is. That has to, that has to be defined before you can create some kind of uh, structure uh, with a wireframe. So from strategy comes uh, the structure. It also communicates and prioritizes an interface of structure, hierarchy, and basic functionality and behavior. And so when we're thinking of structure and hierarchy, you know, what order um, should things be in on the screen? Um, how should it be displayed? Um, and how, uh, in general, um, should it behave and how the people interact with that information. Uh, so it's a prioritization exercise. But importantly, we're establishing that structure before thinking of visual design, so the, the overall final form. So we're leaving out things like typography, color, and uh, general layout. We talk, start talking about things like um, you know, column structure and things like that. And layout is the one that there's a lot of crossover. Uh, you know, where do we start defining the layout? Is it in the wireframe or is it uh, in visual design? And is there a difference? And so you can think of these wireframes as like the skeleton of a user interface, uh, especially for screen-based devices. Um, so you can create wireframes for anything, but uh, when I'm talking about these, it's primarily on the web. But it could be for applications, watches, um, car dashboards, anything like that. So why do we use wireframes? And some of these may be obvious, but the first reason is we want to establish focus. We want our clients and our team to uh, concentrate on the content and priority of that content without focusing on the visual design, right? So we're creating focus um, on that structure that's most important um, at that part of the project. And when we talk about the different you know, elements of user experience, this is from the Jesse James Garrett model, um, we're kind of building from strategy at the bottom uh, and working all the way up to 
surface level. Um, so what's that final form? So we start with strategy, um, then we define the scope. What should that interface do for us? Um, what are the specifications? Um, how should it be structured in terms of information architecture, you know, site map, labeling? Um, then you take that structure and put it into some kind of skeleton model, um, like a wireframe, to see how it all comes together. How do you um, prioritize what comes first, um, what's most important in terms of hierarchy? Um, and then once that's defined, um, the idea is then you start to develop the service level, so that final product. And a lot of people think of this in terms of you know building uh, a house. If you're building a house, you don't start with the the wallpaper and the furniture. Um, you really start with that the blueprint um, before you can start adding all of the design elements necessary inside. Or you can start to add structure. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is reducing risk, and this is really big. I think in more of the larger agency world, um, we're all about creating deliverables that reduce the amount of risk because a lot of these projects we're dealing with are very, uh, have a big team working on them at high hourly rates. And any kind of misunderstanding um, early on uh, can have really drastic effects later on in the process, right? So uh, if we don't have that established shared understanding with the client about what we're building and how we should build it, that foundational knowledge um, we're wasting valuable resources. And um, like I said, in a larger agency uh, where I work, that could be detrimental to the pro project. Uh, timelines get um, you know, pushed back. We've all seen this kind of happen because we didn't have a shared understanding early on. So wireframes help us do that. And in fact, a lot of agencies ask for sign-off uh, at a certain point, right? So you've seen the wireframes, um, everything looks good, we've made revisions, and then the client literally signs off on it somehow, and that kind of locks them into um, reversing their decision later on. Uh, and we'll talk about that. That's some advantages and disadvantages, certainly, to locking people or the client um, or your team into a decision, um, especially in a more of an agile environment that we're trying to create. Uh, the third benefit here, why we would use these, is uh, facilitating client communication. You know. Showing, giving somebody a visual representation that they can react to. It's very hard to give somebody the strategy for the site and you know the content in a standalone document and say, okay, does everything look good? Um, the client many times says, no, I need to see it. I need to see it represented in some kind of uh, visual structure that I can react to, that I can understand. Uh, so we're uh, communicating through some kind of visual structure that's still low fidelity enough that we're not building the actual end product. Uh, so by giving them that visual structure, we're again preventing those misunderstandings and making the project a little less abstract. Um, so we're starting to solidify it in the minds of the client um, or your internal team or stakeholders. And finally, rapid iteration. Uh, so the idea here is if we create something low fidelity and low detail, it should be relatively inexpensive to refine and make changes to uh, because we haven't spent a ton of time thinking about the visual design or going ahead and developing it. Um, in, as we know, developing can, changes can be the most expensive down the line um, in some instances. And you really have to think about this in terms of what fidelity and tools you're using to create wireframes. So in my example, I'm pretty fluent in HTML and CSS. Um, so if I make my wireframes in HTML and CSS, I can rapidly iterate and make changes to those because I'm comfortable in that tool. Um, but give that to somebody else who is influenced in that area, and all of a sudden these wireframes become very expensive and time-consuming to iterate on. So uh, the type of tool that you're using to create these wireframes really depends on how rapidly and inexpensive it is to refine. And if you work in client services, you know there's a lot of refinements. Uh, you know, clients um, have changes, they maybe want to make a change to a label or copy, um, this doesn't seem right, and you should be working in a tool that lets you easily uh, make a change and, and show them and say, here, is this what you mean, and get your feedback from that. It's a constant feedback process. And so here's all those wireframes in terms of fidelity. So our low fidelity to a high fidelity. Low fidelity, we're talking, you know, the sketches, uh, the content documents, gray box wireframes, and I would say some of the clickable prototypes. 
they're of course lower risk and lower cost because they're less expensive and more rapidly um, edited and iterated on. But they're also more abstract. So um, if I look at the sketch, I'm getting a more abstract uh, version of what the final interface would look like than that high fidelity example at the very uh, right. These high fidelity ones, like a mock-up, um, a comp, some people call them, you know, a programmatic prototype, um, or even HTML, or high scale, uh, grayscale wireframes are higher risk. So certainly um, they're gonna be a little bit more difficult to make changes and iterate, but also more difficult to go backwards and um, adjust the, the layout if something's not working because you've already shown it in such a high fidelity format. Um, so we want to be somewhere probably in the middle, um, if not more toward the low fidelity where we can easily iterate earlier on the process. And as we get long, further into the design process, we get less abstract um, and higher fidelity is the goal. So we're showing something that's more realistic of what I get um, as the final product without building the final product. And the prototypes, how do they work in here? Prototypes can really be created from any type of wireframe, whether that's a sketch prototype all the way up to you know, high fidelity. That's basically creating some kind of simulation using the wireframe where we're simulating what the interaction would be like if somebody were to use that prototype. And in the past we did this, you know, when I first started out, we were doing a lot of clickable PDFs. Who remembers that going into, yeah, in um, InDesign or um, Acrobat, and just kind of linking PDF files together. It was a very low fidelity way, but it worked, and it still works today, for sure. Um, and you also have more of these programmatic tools. I would call it something like an Axure. Um, it's a kind of a complex, almost software-like program that really is almost recreating um, the software in a prototyping tool. So you can do really complex things in Axure. In some cases, do call for that. You can have logic, for example. Um, and so that's tools we have probably 10, 10 years or so that we've been using. But today's tools have really started to change. We have some new tools at hand uh, that I want to talk about in a few slides. That includes HTML prototyping, um, linking our boards together with something like Envision or Sketch in XD. Um, or something like complex animation. So there's programs out there, like one's called Framer, that let us do complex animations and really show something in a high fidelity format. And those tools are a bit out of the scope of this presentation, but they are out there. Okay, so talk about all these benefits of wireframes. Um, and they're really useful tools, but where do they fall down? What are the downsides? Uh, some of these articles I alluded to um, already talked about some of the downsides in um, one way or another. The big one that I hear all the time is wireframes a lot of times make design assumptions. And what do I mean by that? that? That means that very early on in the process, the UX designer or whoever's creating the wireframe already is starting to make assumptions about layouts uh, or typography uh, or imagery um, early on in the process and uh, this creates what I call the coloring book effect, where uh, it only leads the designer into kind of filling in um, the, the black and white with color and images, and they don't have a lot of flexibility. They're almost locked into a design. So if you take a wireframe like this on the left, um, and then the designer comes in and kind of just fills in, fills it in with colors and pictures, uh, and they feel locked into this format because we've already said hey, I want this to be you know, stacked uh, with graphics on the left, and uh, the form needs to go on the right, and here's kind of the sizing, and the designer has uh, just kind of directly translated it and filled in the gaps. And if you're a designer, you're probably like, this isn't a uh, very good use of my skills, and I didn't really get to um, utilize a lot of uh, my opinions and my ideas of how this should act. Uh, but at the same time, um, let's say we have a sign-off from the client on this wireframe. Um, the client signed off and said, this is how I want it to be. Well, the designer kind of feels like I don't have a lot of flexibility here uh, uh, because they've already agreed to this format. Um, I'm kind of locked into uh, what they've agreed on. And I'm not saying this is a bad format. I'm just saying it's given them less options uh, to choose from as a designer. And this changes if you're, also, you're the UX designer and also the visual designer. Uh, it, obviously, you're kind of already thinking about design when you do the wireframing. So, um, this really comes into play when it's maybe a UX individual and a visual design person. Now on the 
flip side too, they can be time consuming. So at uh, my agency, we spend a lot of time making wireframes presentable to clients. Uh, so uh, they look designed, um, they're very visually appealing, and I think that comes from, you know, they're paying good money for our, uh, our work, our UX research, and we want these products to have a certain level of professionalism. And uh, so we get into the uh, mindset that everything has to look designed, and we can't show the client you know, anything that's uh, you know not imperfect or you know, sketched or just a cursory idea. In fact, we, we have them uh, proofread uh, every single wireframe. Uh, it goes through a proofread process, and it's iterated on and uh, refined. So they can be time consuming if you, um, depending on that lo level of fidelity. Um, and that can be bad because in the end, uh, what are the wireframes used for it? Uh, when the product launches, where do the wireframes go? Uh, they're kind of just like saved in the archive somewhere on the server um, if, if it's one of these static wireframes and no one ever looks at it again. So in a way, it's one of these throwaway deliverables. It's not something that in the end is used in the final product. The ideas, of course, are there in that final product, but uh, that deliverable is thrown away. So it's a shame to spend so much time and energy um, making these things look really great when in the end uh, they're not used in the final product. And um, that's just for all these things, really. Uh, mock mockups, even mockups, um, static mockups especially. Yes, the ideas are there, but a lot of the mockup itself is thrown out and has to be recreated in HTML and CSS and JavaScript, right? Uh, it's not used. Whereas the things that are used in that final product, anything written directly transfers over, anything done in HTML. Uh, anything done as a living pattern library, and any vector graphics that we were able to export out uh, into the final website. But all these things, you know, we spend all this time on them, but in the end, they don't make it into the final product. So we have to think about that. Uh, another thing, uh, I alluded to this earlier, uh, they're too simplistic. So on the low fidelity side, we've heard this many times, we can't show that to our clients. You know, again, not looking professional enough. Uh, so that's a criticism. Pen and paper especially, uh, a lot of people feel like that's not an appropriate deliverable to show the clients. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but uh, in a certain agency, depending uh, on your size and your relationship with your clients or your users, uh, these are considered overly simplistic. So uh, something like this. Uh, a really good deliverable for us to think about how things should be laid out um, but is this a deliverable that you share with the client or get approval on? Um, that's really up to you and your team. And the flip side of that, of course, is perfection and polish. So they look too good. They take too much time spending the wrong or solving a wrong problem. Uh, we're working too much to make these look polished for clients. So it's something like this. Um, I would consider this not really a wireframe. Like they've made a, it's in grayscale, but they've made a ton of. Uh, decisions here already. There's some missing colors and images and maybe typography, but not a lot of flexibility for the visual designer to come in here at this point. It's too late or too far along. Um, so how do we step this back and scale it back um, so that we're not, again, locking ourselves in too early in the process to a, some kind of representation or form. And finally, of course, when we talk about responsive design, so uh, multi-device design um, and interactivity. Wireframes definitely, the, the classic version of wireframes fall down because we have trouble showing interaction, like hover states, uh, menus, those kinds of things. How are they going to work? But also, uh, they are static and fixed. So we can't show changes in screen size. What happens you know, at a medium screen size um, or large screen size? That's very difficult, difficult to show in a static medium. So a lot of times what we do is end up creating you know, a small wireframe or mobile and then the desktop wireframe. And that's words I hear used all the time. And of course, if you work in web design, you know there's no such thing as just like a mobile screen size and a desktop screen size. Those are uh, just shorthand way of, ways of talking about the two extremes between the small screen and the large screen. It doesn't account for anything in between. Uh, so this is just an oversimplification. And it might work fine for when we're talking about wireframes, but when we start to talk about how that website is actually going to be developed, uh, we can't just look at it from a mobile or desktop perspective. It doesn't work anymore. So uh, we need a way to fill in the gaps, what happens in between the smallest and the large screen. Especially with 52% of web traffic being from mobile devices today, uh, we really have to put more emphasis on the smaller screens, uh, as it turns out. Uh, when I see 
keep wireframes and mockups presented, a lot of times we're very fixated on the large screen format. Um, I'm sure I see a few nods here. Uh, so, and that's actually you know, the least number of users according to web analytics. So how do we place more emphasis on you know, the smaller screens where the majority of users on the web are using our product? So some of these problems can be solved. There's some solutions out there. The new world wireframes. So I want to take you through some uh, ideas I've been trying out with wireframes to kind of combat some of these downfalls. Um, you know, with lock-in and defining the design too early, and also multi-screen and interactivity. How do we solve for those in today's wireframe? First one that I've alluded to many times in the presentation is HTML wireframes. And uh, for somebody that's maybe not familiar with you know, coding or CSS, this, is, this could feel a little overwhelming, right? Making wireframes in HTML, why are we coding so early in the process? And uh, I've you know, included this idea by teams within the organization and other organizations. They've said, you know, we're designers, we don't code, uh, we have developers for that, and we don't want to touch the code. And my argument is, you know, we're building websites in the end, especially in web design, and uh, why not use the medium that we're building for to kind of also build our first design products uh, in as well. Uh, you know, we get things like responsive for free if we build in the browser, uh, and we can also reuse some of that code, um, presumably in the final product. It's not a throwaway deliverable if done in HTML. And so people like Brad Frost and others have started to experiment with this. So this is a wireframe, a very simple low fidelity wireframe built in HTML. Very few you know, design decisions here. Of course, there's some um, design thinking in the header, um, perhaps. But all he's showing is you know, this is the order, the priority of things that should go on the page. Um, and this is the hierarchy. This is what we want. And um, it was very simple to do. You know, if you took a beginner HTML class, you could probably do some you know, H1s and H2s, hopefully. Uh, and then maybe some background colors in there for you know, the shape of gray. Very simple. And what he'll do is start out with something like this um, in HTML, just very low fidelity. And he'll build on this um, as they go through the design process. Maybe they'll go into a uh, graphics program and start to mock up something and then come back to the browser after they've figured it out. Uh, so they're not completely doing it in the browser. Um, but they'll start to iterate on it. Uh, make changes and show this to the client as they do. Um, and so that first web page kind of transitions um, through several states and then, and then becomes that final uh, web page. And of course, this is a responsive wireframe. So I'm showing you a static image right now, but it's in the browser. So they've already thought about um, how that screen size is going to change uh, as they've gone through this process. And they've also built it mobile first because, of course, on the uh, mobile screen, Typically, you're stacking things and prioritizing that way, one on top of the other. So you're already thinking mobile first, not desktop first, when you take this approach. So that's HTML wireframes. And uh, one thing that I found um, is using a program like CodePen, which is free, codepen.io. Um, this is basically a coding tool right within your browser. And so if you're building HTML, you don't want to worry about you know, setting up a server, like installing all the software. Um, it has all the software just right within your browser. And you kind of code at the top, and then your um, end design deliverable comes out at the bottom immediately. Uh, so I use this uh, just to kind of experiment with it for a client. Um, so like my, this is my HTML up here. Um, and then I kind of make a change, and then you save it in the browser refreshes to show that immediately. And uh, you can get a link generated right away, so you have a link to share with the rest of the team. And the rest of the team can come in here and work on the same you know, HTML document along with you. So it's very collaborative. And of course, you're getting HTML, or you're getting uh, the responsive as part of this, so you don't have to worry about you know, the mobile size and the desktop size and having two different wireframes and the update for everything. Um, this is, I would say, more along the higher fidelity level of a wireframe if you look at it. I wouldn't recommend starting at this point. It's going to take a lot of time, and again, uh, we don't want to start too low or high fidelity in the process. We want to start low fidelity. So this is a, this took um, some substantial time, right, because I created all these components from scratch. Um, so you don't want to be at this level at the beginning. Start really simple, just with H1, H2 tags. Uh, and then work your way up to something like this. Uh, and the idea here 
is that hopefully when we start to integrate design, we use this exact same document to start to add styles um, to the wireframes. We're not starting over with the design in a certain, you know, a separate program. So this is our entire prototyping tool, and we build on the code that previous people have built for us. So um, we hand this off to more of an interaction designer, and hopefully they can take this and start to form the styles and the overall final prototype using this code, uh, so we don't have to recreate some things. That would be an ideal world. Uh, another approach that I've shown some of these two is what's called the priority guide. They call it the priority guide in a list of part. Um, and this is basically taking all the contents and elements that you want to see on the screen and in a static format, just showing it in boxes without defining things like structure. So you can see the, the difference here between um, the higher fidelity wireframes I showed you and this, which is really just you know, taking what I was showing in HTML and doing it in a static format, main content, and so on. It's going to go with this from high to low. Um, this example here has a little bit more detail. They've annotated every section of the page. Um, you can see structure here, certainly. Um, you can imagine this on a mobile phone, uh, but it's given the designer uh, a lot more flexibility. So if I come in here as more of a visual designer, uh, I can take these elements and arrange them in a way that I think is suitable for the content. But I already have established the structure and the order and the priority. So it's a step backwards from the examples I showed you um, in a good way. And you can do this in a spreadsheet. So I've used you know, Google Sheets. I, I love Google Sheets. I live in it. Um, just because it's so easy to edit, collaborate, share. Yeah, Sean knows I use it all the time. And you know, I'll just take like an outline, like I have a home page, and you know, a sheet, a spreadsheet is well suited uh, for this kind of format because it's already in a vertical column-based format, right? So uh, I love this approach. And you can have you know notes and annotations right within the spreadsheet. You can also do this with sticky notes, um, you know, traditional sticky notes, or virtually. So this is a tool we use um, to define priority and content called Mural. Mural.co, uh, and this is basically a virtual sticky note tool um, where you can you know, take these notes from the side and you place them onto this whiteboard, and you can have as many collaborators from your team as you want in there, kind of editing them and reorganizing them. Uh, and we've even put the client in here before and you know, had them watch as we kind of organize the content and said, you know, for the home page, uh, we should really have the client testimonial up above services, that's more important. So we can kind of take that and rearrange the page live, um, again, without worrying about the visual layout and the, you know, the columns and um, all those things that are more visual design oriented at this level. That's Mural, um, big fan of that. And then even a step back further is uh, what one author calls a story frame or, or a content document. And this is what I showed you before. Uh, basically taking a step back and going into a blank document like a Google Doc and just writing your content as if you were telling a narrative. So what's the narrative of this, of this web page? And if you think about it, every web page should kind of tell a story uh, from beginning to end. So uh, what do I want to say at the top and then going down? Uh, probably at the bottom I want to have some kind of call to action like get started now. So I'm just formulating the content and the priority uh, more as a static uh, story document that I can then edit right within the browser and get feedback on, again, before I go into the final deliverable. Uh, so this is a really good way. I like this. Um, again, in Google Docs, really easy to create these and share them with a client or your team members to uh, perfect these documents in terms of content and priority before you start building that structure. UI libraries. So um, this is a little higher fidelity. Um, and you might be familiar with tools like Balsamic um, are really big on these. So this is basically a user interface library for wireframing. So basically, they provide you with all these pre-built components that you can kind of place together um, into some kind of format. Um, so you spend less time thinking about the actual UI elements and more about the priority and what should go in what place. So they'll give you things like tabs and a carousel. Uh, paragraphs and you kind of place them onto uh, this document in the order that you think. And the good thing with these is uh, you don't really have the ability to create new components. Uh, so as 
much as you want to jump into design, um, you can actually modify these things. So it is essentially locking you into a specific um, kind of uh, fidelity of design. So you can't make those new components. And you think about more of the interaction structure and functionality, less about what should this look like. Um, and I know from uh, my own experience, I if I have the ability to change something, uh, I'll start thinking about things like typography and spacing um, at too early of a level and get really fixated on it and uh, can't st take a step back from that. Um, and that's just maybe coming from more of a design background. But um, do you have these for Sketch and XP as well? So you can download these free UI toolkits. And same thing, they give you, you know, a tab bar and a menu bar. Uh, the danger with using XP and Sketch for these is, of course, you can create your own components and modify these components. So you have to have a lot of discipline to really use the pre-built components. And uh, for me, I, I just can't do it. Like, I, I really want to just change that tab to be rounded <laughs> like this. And I can, so I'm going to. So you have to have a lot of self-discipline. Uh, but it is one option. Interactive wireframe. So this is probably the one that's undergone the most change um, in the last few years. There are uh, so many apps that have been released that allow you to rel rather simply make your static wireframes interactive. And many of you have probably used one or more of these tools. Um, and so something like Adobe XD, essentially what you're doing is you're creating static artboards and linking them together. So hotspots, so if I click, click on this menu, then it shows this artboard um, and it kind of simulates um, that some kind of interactive behavior is happening without actually programming it. Um, and of course, these um, components, these deliverables don't really contribute, again, to the final website or app in any way, um, but they're just being demo, um, they're just a demonstration of interactivity. Um, there are, I have seen demo many times uh, and talked about, you know, this is the holy grail app that you can design in a static tool and it's going to output um, a final website that you can use in production. And in my experience, uh, I've never seen one that works well or performs well or um, is accessible or well structured. Um, and so, I, I, for now at least, I don't see that happening. I think static wireframes and mockups are going to remain separate uh, in many cases from the final deliverable. Um, this is what something like Envision looks like. How many Envision users are there out there? Yeah. yeah. Um, Envision is really great uh, for sharing your work with clients, getting comments, um, but also adding things like interactivity. So you upload your images or sync them from um, a tool, and then you can, again, link them, even create things like menu overlays um, with some really light animation effects. Um, so I really like this tool. This is the one that we use um, in-house. And then you kind of end up with something like this. It's like a mobile app that wireframe that I did in XD. Um, and it really feels like kind of a native experience, especially when we're talking about native mobile applications. Uh, and you can create something that feels really realistic and gives you a really good idea of what the user flow is. Um, but it is fairly low fidelity, so we're not making too many design assumptions um, with this level. Um, and then if you need something with more advanced animations, these tools aren't going to you know, solve that problem. Uh, many times the animations are pretty much like fade in, fade out, um, dissolve, those kind of things. So uh, there's better tools for those types of things. And then the final point I wanted to make is you don't have to show and present all wireframes or all levels of fidelity to clients. Some of these things can be kept just internally um, within your team or even with just you as the UX designer to help you get to a certain idea or form a certain thought. Um, they don't have to be thought of as deliverables. Um, so you can utilize them internally. Uh, something like sketches or lo-fi. Um, you can pick at what point is this presentable or should it be shared with a client. Um, the caution I'd have for you is sharing something too late in the process. So what's that happy medium where we're sharing something and we have enough time to get feedback before we're too far into the process with too many hours burned and we're too uh, far into the timeline. Uh, it's always something you're thinking about uh, when you're doing a client project. Uh, and I think this looks
you have a really good relationship with your client, you feel a little bit better you know, sharing sketches um, and maybe sharing some uh, light wireframes with the client and not having to worry about is this presentable, is, it, you know, is there a spelling error, um, is there something that's not quite perfect here. Um, it really depends on that relationship and you know, what the overall vibe is uh, with your clients. And uh, I think this uh, becomes particularly important uh, with these new hybrid, I call them ex experience designer roles. Um, seeing these a lot lately. Um, this is the role where um, maybe you all do the wireframes, the information architecture, you know, the UX part of the project, um, but you're also responsible for the visual design, interaction design, the even prototyping part of the project. And I'm starting to see these roles pop up more and more. And I'm not saying that um, this is the way we should be going, um, but if you are one of these people who have these skill sets, um, you can move a little bit more freely between deliverables without having to worry about making everything presentable um, because you're the one doing the wireframes and um, you kind of already have an idea of how that will translate into the visual design. So you can um, choose what to show to the client um, and uh, be a little more agile and you know what, what uh, kind of fidelity should I use at any moment in the project. Um, so if you're kind of you're working just on the UX side and you maybe have a separate visual designer, um, this may not work as well for you. You may have to have that more formal handoff. Here's the final wireframe, and here's the start of the visual design process. Um, so you have to make it a little bit more formalized just because there's maybe two different contributors working on it. Um, and um, you know that could create more of like a waterfall approach where we're kind of handing off things. Um, but it's kind of a reality in some situations, especially, like I said, a larger agency uh, where you know, the visual designer can't be involved until it's time for their part of the project. It's just an unfortunate reality sometimes. Um, so for me, I'm working you know, on a redesign of my personal site, and you know, I don't have a client um, that I have to hand, hand off things to or get approved, um, and I'm also doing the entire process. So uh, for me, that kind of works well to kind of start with more of a wireframe, uh, black and white, um, and then quickly kind of iterate that into more of a design um, using that wireframe, and then take that design and start to um, use something like CodePen to uh, kind of validate and code that component out and see how it works within the browser. Um, so I'm kind of doing this entire pro process um, as a you know, hybrid experience designer. Not everyone has that luxury or that skill set, um, or even wants to have that um, level of responsibility. You maybe want to be focused um, on just one part of the design process, and that's totally fine. But if you are more of a hybrid, you can kind of, these deliverables kind of blend into one another and are less defined throughout the process. So just some final thoughts uh, before we take a look at our document. Um, have you added to the document? Yeah. Okay, so final thoughts. Wireframes are not equal to UX. So, um, when we talk about UX, many times uh, people in the agency uh, or organization see you as the wireframe person. You know, uh, that's, the, that's the guy that does the wireframes. And uh, they don't think about how you should be involved in you know, the research process or the information architecture. Uh, so wireframing does not equal UX. And uh, you shouldn't let people you know, just see you as kind of the, the person that generates the wireframes and then goes away on the next project. You really have to be involved from an overall strategic perspective. Um, so make your value known just beyond these deliverables. Your deliverables are not the value, you know, what you do, what UX designers do. Um, and don't ever make a wireframe without first understanding the strategy and the scope of the project. It's really important. Of course, content and strategy inform wireframes. Um, so if you don't have a good understanding of what content is going to be going into a site, a website, or application, uh, you really can't create a wireframe without knowing that content or content structure. Uh, if somebody asks you to create it with Lorem, if some, you know, just fill in Lorem, if some, we'll figure it out later. Uh, that really provides little to no value to anyone. Think about it, like Lorem, if some, what does that mean? What content is going to go into this section? Uh, to only use it if you really can't, uh, if you have no idea what content will be um, in that particular wireframe. But I try to, even if I have to write the content myself, I make up some you know, garbage content that kind of 
that says what I wanted to say um, even before I have a content copywriter um, on the project. It makes it so much more meaningful. Every organization and project is going to be different in terms of wireframes. So um, what I'm saying here may or may not work for your organization or your project. And in terms of projects, every project is different. If you have a smaller website, it's going to be different than a large scale enterprise site where you're working with you know, a huge client and a big team. Um, so every read every situation and pick the deliverable that you think is right for that um, project. Use your time and resources wisely when we're thinking about wireframes. Don't overdo it. Uh, don't blow all of your budget uh, making these wireframes look um, really, really nice and designed if they don't add value to the project. What's good enough uh, to get you by to demonstrate something? And then finally, um, early collaboration is really essential. So um, we can't work on wireframes in isolation without knowing how that's going to translate itself into a visual design in the end, and how that visual design is going to translate into a developed final project. We have to uh, communicate as a team um, and think about you know, what is the, why are we doing this wireframe in the first place, and how is it going to add value to the rest of the team and the project. Okay, and then finally, um, a lot of people you know, ask what do you, what do you use in terms of wireframes, what's your toolkit? Um, so again, these are things that work for me um, that I use on a daily basis uh, with multiple clients. So of course, pen and paper, sticky notes, you, know, um, you can't really get by just jumping into the software. Um, you have to think through your ideas first. Uh, Sketch has really transformed the entire wireframing and UX process for me. That's sketchapp.com um, by a company with the company uh, Bo Bohemian Coding. And um, Sketch is just such a great tool. They have uh, interactivity built into the program now. Um, and it's really replaced things like uh, Illustrator or Photoshop for me in my design process. I hardly touch those things anymore. Uh, Adobe XD is a great alternative to Sketch. Um, Sketch is Mac only, by the way. XD is cross-platform. Uh, similar features, not as much of a design tool. It's a little bit lower fidelity. Google Apps, of course, for the spreadsheets, the Google Docs. Um, Mural is the one I mentioned. That's the virtual sticky notes um, for prioritizing and um, ideation. I love it. CodePen is the tool that lets you do HTML and CSS within the browser. And then Envision is the app that lets you share design assets with clients and make them interactive, clickable. Um, and a lot of times, you'll export things from Sketch um, into Envision. Um, you don't actually create the things in Envision. So um, that's my toolkit. Um, and so I just wanted to revisit before we wrap up um, how you use wireframes in your process. Um, just, just take a look at what we have here. Um, so in terms of do we use them? Okay, so well, as much as we should, yes, that seems to frustrate clients. That's that's interesting. You have to wrote that one. You don't have to. Yeah. What what uh, causes frustration? Do you think? Most of my they, I think they so badly want the design and yeah. so completely resistant to a wire frame. That they're like, okay, yeah, can we see the design? Yeah. And I'm like, just get to the design. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Let's go this first. And they won't even pay attention to it. Yeah. And so the point of the wire frame was to purposely uh, use the distractions of colors and pictures and images. And I think some people just they are just they won't go there. They're just like, yeah. no, I need the picture. Yeah. In the end, the wire frame is more distracting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th this. Um, we have to frame these, these things first off when we're showing them um, in, a, in a way you know, where we explain, you know, this is what this is, this is what the wireframe does, and this is uh, what it is not. You're not going to see the colors, the type, the layout. And sometimes you know, we give that explanation, um, and it, they're just fixated and want to see the design. But I think explaining the benefits of why we're having a focus um, on you know, the content, um, we're doing this so we don't waste time um, or go over budget later. Um, is a really good uh, factor that we can you know, try to use to convince them. Um, a few people say, you know, yes, uh, for each website, okay. Part of the process, creating a higher fidelity from initial sketches. Okay, so um, kind of starting simple, which is what I rec you know, recommend, starting with a sketch, something very simple, and working your way up. Um, whether that's through a static uh, project um, or something like HTML, like I showed you in the browser. And it depends on the project. That's a really good one, too. Um, do we always need wireframes for everything? No, um, especially if a design system already exists. Uh, a lot of times, we'll actually go backwards and recreate something as a wireframe just because. Uh, when did we really need to? Couldn't we have just you know, gone into, gone
gone and did, did a prototyping code um, or in a higher fidelity program. Um, the most common levels up here, so sketches, low fidelity, okay, one high fidelity, lower the better, low high and mock ups, so again, kind of going through that process from low to high um, in terms of extraction. Um, iterative, it starts with sketches, it goes to the sketch app, um, and there we can make the wireframe interactive sketches. Yep. So this, this very much mirrors our process, I would say. Um, and then finally, advantages and disadvantages, some things you thought of. Um, people, advantages, people don't get too invested in design. In design. Um, it help us define what will actually be on the website and see problems before we get there. Um, eliminating risk, right? Creating agreements, shared agreement. Um, guidelines for creative teams. Focus away from design now, um, staying on hierarchy and a way to communicate content structure and hierarchy, right? Um, and disadvantages, yeah. Look down upon, um, or show full unfinished work, yeah. And that's going back to that thing, you know, we can't show the client this because it's not perfect. Um, we need to show them the final design before we can get feedback. Um, it's a common one. Confusing clients, even confusing users, right? You show somebody this in a usability test, um, a low fidelity for the site that they're fixating on. And where's the color? Um, I get that all the time. Um, being confused, frustrated, time consuming, they want. Uh, and then misinterpreting wireframes as the final design, blocking you in. Um, so, uh, this isn't meant to you know, define anything one way or another, um, or say you should do wireframes or you shouldn't, uh, but hopefully you have a good framework for you know, what are um, the key advantages and disadvantages to wireframes, and hopefully what are some uh, different ways that we can use to kind of combat um, some of these frustrations you all uh, talked about today. Uh, so I hope it gave you something to think about, and uh, again, thank you for your time. We started after lunch late. Yeah. Everything was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. You know, if anyone has questions, yeah. What are some strategies for user testing at the wireframe stage? That's, that's a difficult one. It does depend on the client. Um, you know, if we are user testing using wireframes, certainly it should be interactive. So some level of interactivity. I don't think you can show them a static piece of paper um, and expect them to react to it. It's just you know, too low fidelity in most cases. Um, especially if we're, if there's a lot of expense in recruiting for these studies. So it should be interactive. And again, that explanation of what this is and what this isn't, I 